Hello, VC. Uh, Jeff here once again, and it is the end of February. We are closing in on the end of February, and I forgot about Bobby Z's February contest. So while there's still a few days left in the month, I want to try to get this entry in. Now, just moving this camera a little closer so I can sit back. Now the <clears throat> couple disclaimers here. There's going to be no music in this video, so if you watch me for records or music, that won't be in this video. So, um, of course, you can see these records right here, back here. Those are all the ones that I cleaned from the state sale hall from a couple days ago, but I'm out of inner sleeves, so I'm just leaving them in that dish drainer. Which I bought. I finally bought a new, a, a separate dish drainer just for records. Instead of using the kitchen one every time. Duh. So, um, but anyway. Uh, Bobby's contest, since of course Valentine's Day is in the middle of the month. The theme of the contest is all about love. And, <clears throat> I know I told him I was going to give the entire story about how I met my wife. My wife name, wife's name is Corrine. I'm just going to quit calling her my wife. I'm just going to call her Corrine or Cor. Uh, and there's no, um, I didn't write any notes down. I didn't write like a script or anything. I'm just going off memories in my head. I think I've got everything kind of in the right order. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. I guess I'll just start. Let me make sure this camera's straight. Okay. It always seems to be crooked to me. It always looks crooked when I'm filming. And I have a lozenge in my mouth because Cor was sick the last two days. And I can feel that tightness. You know, you get in your chest, like the congestion. I can feel it coming on. And I'm already starting to cough a little bit, so <clears throat> I've got this lozenge in here to try to help me get through this without breaking into a coughing fit, which would just ruin everything. So bear with me. All right. Disclaimers are out of the way. In the fall of 1990, I had just finished two years at a community college and I'd gone as far as I could go there. Obviously it was just a two year community college. So I had to transfer to a different school to continue my studies to get a four-year degree. So I transferred to a college which is local here in the South Chicago area called St. Xavier's. And in the fall of 1990, I started going there. And it was in uh, I was in an American Lit class because I had started pursuing the uh, English, uh, an English major to get my degree, which is what I ended up with, a degree in English Lit. So I remember I was in an American Lit class with one of the most brilliant teachers that I'd ever come across up to that point. It was a wonderful class, and we were reading, you know, books like Moby Dick and um, Rappuccini's Daughter by Hawthorne. You know, a lot of the early American <clears throat> famous authors, Poe. And uh, I remember being in that class and there were, um, there weren't like desks, there were, there were more or less tables and there would be groups of people sitting all around the room. You know, there would be like three or four people per table. And uh, I ended up sitting, sitting next to this girl who was really cute, really smart, and very articulate and friendly. So, you know, as we're going through the classes day after day, you know, started getting, getting to kind of know each other a little bit, talking here and there before and after class. <clears throat> and there was another girl who sat like right across from me across the table. Cor sat next to me. And 
one day, for whatever reason, I had to miss a class. I don't remember why now. And uh, I came back, you know, the, the next time. And um, before class started, I, you know, was asking uh, Cora if she had, like, you know, what, what, what went on in the class that I missed and notes and stuff like that. And, and she told me she... <laughs> She told me that uh, the girl who sat across from us, I don't remember her name anymore, asked where I was, if she knew where I was. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Cora tells me, he goes, I don't think I like that girl. <laughs> that was the first sign that I knew that it, it let me, it, it was like a little peek into her personality that is a trademark of her personality these days. <laughs> so... <clears throat> I was a little taken aback, but, you know, things went on, you know, we were kind of friendly with each other, and the class ended at the end of the term, and <clears throat> came back to school in spring of 91, so this would be, uh, like, early January, and we were together in a Shakespeare class. And that's where um, we had started studying together because uh, St. Xavier's has a beautiful library. Beautiful. Still does to this day. And there was a separate room in the library. It's called the Bishop Quarter Reading Room. And it had beautiful walnut panels, paneling all over the walls. You know, there were bookshelves filled, you know, and they had couches and, you know, wing back leather chairs, and it was very, very nice room. And that's where we started meeting in the mornings before class to get work done and, and to hang out a little bit and, and all that stuff. So as time went by, she would always beat me there. She would always be there by the time I got there every morning. And I remember, I remember entering the, the room all the time and, and she'd be sitting at the couch, like right in front of one of the windows. And, the, and when it was sunny out, the sunlight would just come right through the window. And I swear to God, she looked like an angel to me. <laughs> she was so beautiful. I was like, every time I'd walk in, I would be just taken aback. I'd be like, damn. And at this point in my life, I, I'd had a few girlfriends, but nothing serious, you know, just, I was just kind of, you know, hanging out, doing my thing. And it was, there was nothing too, um, serious or romantic or anything like that up to that point. Core would change all of that eventually. <laughs> so, um... As at spring of 91, which I've, I've made mention of in past videos, bits and pieces here and there, you know, a lot of the music that I'd, I'd showed was on the radio a lot, and I remember all that because I was falling in love with her. So it's like my mind was on, it's like if my mind was a tape player, I had the record button pressed, and I'm remembering everything. So I can't remember too much. Of everything all the time these days but back then my mind was a lot sharper and younger so <clears throat> um, I was falling in love with her but and this is this video is gonna go to a, a, a few places here so bear with me on that too the I'm just gonna cut to the chase the problem was well she was she was falling in love with me too and, you know, you could, you could tell the way she was acting, kind of the way I was acting. We hadn't really verbalized anything yet, but, you know, through our actions, you could tell that she was digging me, too. Only problem. <laughs> well, for one thing, she was, she is two years older than me, so this was like her last semester before she was going to graduate. <clears throat> so, you know. I still had two years to go. And she was engaged to get married. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> Hope that doesn't offend anyone. And this marriage was more out of, 
I think it was less out of love and more out of a need to get out of her family situation and on her own. So, you know, yes, she was engaged. Yes, she didn't really love the guy. She loved me instead. I know. I know. Okay, you don't got to say anything. I know. So, but the heart wants what it wants. It just does. Sometimes there's no denying it. And <clears throat> by the end of that semester, you know, like she was graduating in May of 91. That same weekend, I think she was getting married. So it was this jam-packed affair. Like all of these big life moments for her were all happening like simultaneously practically so uh, there was nothing really I could do about it which sucked because a I still had two more years of school B I didn't really have a, a job a good enough job certainly didn't have any money because all whatever money I had was going towards my schooling and there was really no way that I could be a good husband for her at that time but <clears throat> and, and I have this memory clear as day as, as I'm sitting here as you're looking at my face I'm, I'm visualizing this in my mind this was like near the end of the semester I remember it was a, it was a sunny day out you know it was very warm and we were at a checkers which I don't know if there's checkers around anymore it's like a burger, fast food burger place I don't think there's any around here anymore but there might be elsewhere Anyway, we're sitting behind a checkers. We got some lunch, and she's telling me, you know, she doesn't want to, she doesn't know what she's going to do. She's got everything planned for the wedding. I went with her to, when she was getting her dress fitted, I went with her and I saw her wedding dress before anybody else. I wish to God it was for me, but it wasn't. And... <clears throat> She was all, you know, riled up, didn't know what to do, didn't want to necessarily go through with everything that she was gonna. So, and we're sitting there, and I remember looking at her face while she's talking, and I just said, why don't, why don't you marry me instead? And she looks at me and she goes, what? I said, marry me instead. I said, leave everything as it is. I'll rent a tux, kick him out, and I'll just step in and we can just go along with the with everything that you've got planned and marry me instead. <laughs> it was insane, I know. But I was in love with her. I, there's nothing else, nothing else I could do. She's like, I can't do that. There's no way I can do that. My mom would kill me. Um, da 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 da. Everything is planned and I, everyone's going to be mad at me and yell at me and, and this and that. And I'm like, so what? Marry me instead. You love me, right? She's like, yeah, but I can't. Ugh. So, I tried. I tried getting her to marry me instead. And it's something that, when I want to poke a little fun at her, sometimes I'll bring that up. I'll say, you know, babe, we could be married 27 years instead of just 7 years. <laughs> but anyway, um, by the time that uh, spring of 91 semester ended, I was a mess. And one of the saddest memories I had at that time was of, um, I think it was like the last day of school. I think my classes had ended. She still had to take one more final. So I remember us going out to lunch that day. We went to, uh, I think we went to Connie's Pizza. There used to be one in the mall. <laughs> and we're sitting there. <clears throat> like I said, my mind was on record. So we're sitting there and the waitress asked, because she was paying attention to us talking back and forth. She, she goes, are you guys married? Are you a married couple? And we both looked at her and then we looked at each other and we're both like, no. <laughs> I said no, but I wish I was. <laughs> and... That just kind of, 
it just kind of twisted the knife a little bit more in my heart. So, uh, that last day when I dropped her back off at school, I just kind of sat in my car and just watched her walk away. And that's why I always, uh, I mentioned that Richard Thompson song on the Rumor and Sigh album called I Misunderstood. That was playing, or I'd heard it like right around that time, and I remember her just watching her walk away, and it was just like, like someone just clenched my heart and was just squeezing it. <clears throat> and I was heartbroken. So, after that semester, we didn't really, you know, obviously didn't really see each other. I think we talked on the phone like once or twice. I just wanted to see how she was doing. I wanted to see how everything went out, made out for her, you know, if, if she got, um, if just if she was okay. And she was. But I found out later on that when she was at the uh, church, standing at the at the head of the church, you know, taking her vows to get married, and, and when the, the when the priest goes, you know, is there anyone here who would uh, is there any reason why why these two should not be married? You know that that type of thing, and she told me that she turned around and she looked and she was looking towards the back of the church or anything to see if I'd showed up. You know, it was like that scene out of The Graduate, you know, at the very end where Dustin Hoffman shows up at the church. That was going through her head as she was getting married. She was looking for me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Life went on, though. I, uh... <clears throat> St. Xavier was a very expensive school. I was only able to afford to go there for the two semesters. So I had to transfer out of there and I had to go to a different college to finish off my um, degree. And in the fall of 91, you know, through the winter into the following year, 92, it was a very depressing time. You know, I was just kind of uh, throwing myself into the school I'd been taking six classes at a time in order to catch up to be able to graduate in four years. I still had to go one extra semester after the four years, and that was for student teaching. But to get all my classwork done, I was taking six, six courses per semester, which is a lot of work, let me tell you. So <clears throat> I would basically be living at the school I was going to. I transferred to Governor State University, which is a far drive from where I lived at the time. So I'd basically get up, leave in the morning, and I wouldn't come home till late at night because the classes, the way they were staggered, blah, 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 blah. So bottom line is, I remember it was the winter, and I was taking a class on Thomas Hardy. So we were reading a bunch of novels by Thomas Hardy, and if you've never heard of him or don't know anything about him, <clears throat> he wrote uh, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, uh, The Mayor of Castor Bridge, Far From the Matting Crowd, stuff like that. Novels like that. And basically they're all about unrequited love <laughs> and lives getting ruined by unrequited love, which was the last thing that I needed to be reading about being in the mental and emotional condition that I was still recovering from. So that just kind of made it even more depressing. I remember sitting in the library there, and their library is nowhere near as nice as the Xavier Library. But <clears throat> I remember sitting by a window, and it would just be snowy and, and windy and just depressingly cold outside. And, and I'd be reading these novels that were depressing and just, ugh. It was very, very difficult time to get through. But, like I said, life went on. I ended up graduating. I got my degree in English Lit. Never used it. I was going to be a teacher, and my student teaching experience was so bad that it put me off the profession of teaching. <laughs> and that's a story for another whole video, if I do one. But, <clears throat> um, 
Cora was always in the back of my mind. She always had a piece of my heart, whether she knew it or not. And, you know, I'd gone on and I'd had other relationships since, you know, I graduated in 93. I think the last time I actually saw Cora was 94 or 5. I just wanted to, uh, I don't know what I, I stopped into where she was working. And she was very um, non-talkative, very cold, very standoffish. So <clears throat> that was like, for me, that was like the final nail. I was like, okay, this is over. Jeff, you got to move on. Just, you got to move on. So uh, that was 94. 94, 95, one of those years. And I didn't see or hear from her again until December of 2010. We're going to skip way far ahead now. Uh, in December 2010, I had <clears throat> a the relationship that I talked to, I thought I was talk about, you know, she had the big record collection. You know, we had a house together. And never got married. I asked her and she didn't want to marry me too. What's this? Nobody wants to marry me. What the hell? <laughs> anyway, I uh, was on Facebook. I had just started getting on Facebook and getting active on Facebook in December 2010. Actually, it was December 10th, 2010. And the reason why I remember that is that was the day that I sent the friend request to her, to Cor. Because... Um, you know, when you first get on Facebook, you're, you know, you're looking up people you knew, you know, seeing what they look like, how their lives turned out, you know, maybe sending friend requests and, and talking to them again. And I did that with a bunch of people in high school and college too. And <clears throat> by that point, you know, after say 15 years or so, you know, time, time smooths things over after a while, you know, the bad times don't seem so bad, the good times seem better, and I was just curious, so I sent her a friend request on December 10th, 2010, I got a response not too long after that, <laughs> and she responds with, is it you, not hi, not, oh my God, how are you? Not anything else, just, is it you? And I'm like, yeah, it's me. <laughs> so <clears throat> I, I had, she didn't, uh, I don't think she believed it was, it was really me. So she's like, she's asking me questions like, you know, where did you go to school? And, and, and I'm like, yeah, we went to Xavier, you know, we sat in, in the court, Bishop Quarter room in, you know, in the mornings before class, remember? And that finally... I guess proved to her I was who I said I was. So we're talking back and forth for a couple days after that. And I was certainly not looking to, you know, restart anything romantic at that time. But <clears throat> she, uh, she was very friendly. You know, we were talking and she had, uh, you know, she had two kids and she was still married to the same loser asshole and hated it and was trying to get a divorce. So I guess my Facebook request had come at the right time. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I was telling her about my life, you know, things that was going on with me. By that time, I I was well established at my job, you know, told her about what I did. I was a shift worker. Uh, in 2010, I wasn't a stationary engineer. I was a uh, dissolver operator. So I actually made the, the product that we make at our plant instead of just making the steam to make that product. And um, so I was telling her a little bit about that. Did I have any kids? No. Um, did I, am I married? No. <laughs> and by then, I was already in my, my early 40s. So... You know, we talked back and forth, and then Christmas that year came and went, and it was like a day or two after Christmas, 
and she was going to, um, she had to return something at the mall because something didn't, some clothes that she got for one of the kids. So she's like, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. <clears throat> you know, at that time I was probably on third shift or off or something. She goes, well, why don't you meet me at the mall? And, uh, I said, okay. I, you know, I was, I was very curious just to see what she looked like and what she was like in person. If she was still the same person. So we go to the mall and we're in the parking lot and, uh, I didn't have a smartphone. There weren't really smartphones, I don't think, back then. If there were, I didn't have one. I just had a regular old flip phone. So it rings, and she and I answer it, and it's her, and she goes, turn around. And I'm standing in the middle of the parking lot, and it's just like right out of a movie, you know. So I turn around, and there she is. <laughs> same. She looked it, almost exactly the same. Her hair color was different. She, you know, she was blonde instead of having uh, brunette hair from when I knew her in college. But other than that, she looked the same. Has her arms out wide for a hug. You know, so we hug. And, um, her car was still running and the door was open. So, we go in and we sit in her car and we're talking back and forth and, you know, exchanging life stories and stuff. And it was just like no time had passed at all. <laughs> None at all. And, the thing about my wife, the, the gift she has, is she has the ability to make you feel comfortable in talking to her. Like, and, and it's something that I've never found in anybody else to this point. If I just felt like I could be myself and not have to put on any kind of airs or acts, and I could just talk freely and not be judged. Not that I had anything to be judged about, but you know what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> That's her gift. To this day, that's her gift. And she was telling me what was going on with her. And um, so we started hanging out a little bit more together. She was already talking to a lawyer wanting to get a divorce. And I was like, wow, I can't believe you're still married to that guy. Wow. And she then she told me the story about the church where she was looking for me. And she told me that, you know, a bunch of her friends was trying to get her not to marry the guy she married and to marry me instead, even though I certainly couldn't have supported her <laughs> at that time. But the way it turned out is the way it turned out. You know, that's life. And so over time, you know, we would hang out here and there and it was happening again, and I, I was just, <laughs> I, I don't know if I ever fell out of love with her in the first place, but boy, being around her again was like water to a thirsty man, you know? It felt like this is where I'm supposed to be. This is who I'm supposed to be with. So, uh, I'm going to cut to the chase again. I ended up ending the relationship that I was in. This was in early 2011. <clears throat> Very abruptly at the time because how can I put it? There's, there's certain moments in your life where you know the rest of the way things are going to turn out for you pivot on this decision. And we usually have a couple of those moments in, in our lifetimes where you have to decide what you're going to do, and that's going to determine, like, your fate for the, uh, either a good long while or perhaps the rest of your life. So I knew that I could have stayed where I was and been in basically a loveless relationship. You know, yeah, I had, you know, a little more money in the bank, but nothing else. Or, I could break things off, help her with her divorce, and be with Cor. So, I ended up ending the relationship that I was in, and <laughs> th that went smoother than I thought, which only told me that there really was no love lost in this relationship. 
so I uh, ended up putting the house that we owned together, unfortunately, up for sale in early 2011. She moved out. I told her I wasn't going anywhere because I'd invested my whole life savings at that point into the down payment for the house. So I wasn't just going to dump it. She moved out, took three quarters of the furniture and everything else with her. So it was a pretty empty house. And I lived there by myself <clears throat> throughout most of 2011. And that's that ties into when I started getting back into vinyl because um, I had the uh, record player that I ended up giving to Vinyl Victim's niece. I got that back from uh, my folks and I started using it again. And I just started from scratch with my record collection. <laughs> but like I said, I'm, I'm digressing. So, the house is up for sale, she's getting a divorce from her husband, and she's putting her house up for sale too. <coughs> and that was a pretty terrifying year because I knew I only had enough money to keep the mortgage going for so long. And when that money ran out, I would end up having to start defaulting on my payments, and that was going to sink me financially. Luckily, I got a buyer and I was able to sell the house. I moved out in um, September of 2011. I moved out and I moved into this house here where I'm living now in September of 2011. And <clears throat> all the while, I was building my relationship back up with Core. We uh, gotten to know each other so much better and having more years under my belt and more maturity, I was able to relate to her, I think, a lot easier than I probably did when I was in my 20s in college. So, you know, things were... There were many nights where I was laying awake worried about did I make the right decision? Um, am I going to sell this house? Are we going to make it as a couple? What's going to go on with the kids? Because the both kids were very young, like uh, 10 and 7, I think, was when I first met them. Corbin and Molly. Corbin's 10, was 10 at the time. Molly was 7. And um, <clears throat> the... Uh, I ended up meeting the kids after the divorce was finalized, you know, and some time had passed. Um, I was starting to, you know, hang out with them a little bit more too, trying to get them used to seeing me. <laughs> so <coughs> what I uh, what I ended up doing was uh, I'd gotten the biggest. Uh, bonus at that point uh, that I ever got in my life at work. It was like it was like fifty five hundred bucks take home, and <clears throat> I used that money. And it was this is that was the only time I could have done it because it was the only time I would have had that much money to spend on a ring. So I uh, the day after her birthday, which. Her birthday is uh, October 27th. So on October 28th of 2011, we went back to St. Xavier. We went back to the Bishop Quarter Room, and it had changed some, you know, over the years. The, the furniture had changed, but the room still basically looked the same. So we were kind of just, you know, reminiscing a little bit about college and what it was like and what we were going through and all that stuff. And I had the ring in my pocket. So we were sitting together on, on one of the couches and I had, there was a lull in the conversation for whatever reason. So I reached in my pocket, I slid out of the couch, couch onto the floor, onto one knee, and I opened the box 
and I asked her for a second time if she would marry me. And this time she said yes. So, thank you, God. <laughs> um, <clears throat> from then on, it was everything kind of went in fast forward. And we made marriage plans fairly quickly. My, um, my job had changed again. I became an engineer. Um, instead of a dissolver operator, got a little more in pay, got a lot more in overtime, unfortunately, but that allowed me to be able to pay for most of the wedding, which was what would end up happening. So we got married April 29th, 2012, one of the probably the happiest day of my life, and we've been together ever since. And I love Core as much now as I did back then, or even when we got married, if not more. So um, this is one of those types of uh, relationships where, and it's true, every day I'm, I'm glad to be able to wake up next to her. I'm glad she's in my life because she makes things so much better for me. So... Um, and I get along with the kids really good now too they're both um, Corbin's going to graduate high school this year Molly's a freshman they're both doing great in school he's going to go on to college you know they both will I'm sure and life now is a lot better than it used to be <laughs> There was a lot of bumps in the road to get to where we are now, but boy, that just makes the final result all the sweeter, I have to say. So, um, this is my entry for your contest, Bobby. I uh, <clears throat> hope you enjoy it. Um, haven't opened up this much about my personal life in a video before, so be nice everyone <laughs> and um, good luck to everyone else who entered the contest but personally to me I have already won because I've got Corinne in my life and that's the truth so that's gonna be it this is probably my longest video ever I think so I'm gonna cut it off now thank you all for watching um, I should have enough records for a spin zone next time around. So until then, peace, and I'll see you.